bread of life, his message that he is the bread of life. And in particular, we've been connecting that statement and him being the bread of life to our Eucharistic life, to our habit of Eucharist, knowing that this is our adaptation of that life, and this is the way that we receive the Holy Spirit and are renewed for the life we live. So I just want to recap a little bit before we move on. Now you'll notice, I hope you noticed, that this week's gospel begins with a repetition of some of the verses we heard last week. Did you think I was reading the wrong one at first? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It felt weird until I got to the new part. Um, but this is actually a movement of the gospel story from an exposition of Jesus as the bread of life, which we had last week, to the response of the community that gathered around Jesus and what they did with that teaching. So we're going to follow that path. First, let's just recap so we know the foundation we're standing on in terms of the Eucharistic life. And again, I'm relating our Eucharist to receiving Jesus at the altar, at the altar rail. First of all, Eucharist is the Holy Spirit renewing and rejuvenating us week by week. How, we don't know, but definitely it happens. We receive the Holy Spirit each week in this liminal place when we receive the Eucharist. Lewis Weil, that wonderful liturgist who wrote most, much of our Book of Common Prayer 79 says, in Christian worship, God gives himself continually as he did in Christ. And that self-giving of God is the power by which Christians live their lives. So Eucharist gives us the Holy Spirit and the power to live this life of faith that we have encountered. It is also a bridge between things that seem separate or things that are, seem to be opposites, the spiritual and the physical, because we receive spiritual nurture from physical elements, the past, the present, and the future, heaven and earth, because this is a thin place where they meet, and even life and death. Our community gathered in Eucharist, as we are today, participates in the Trinitarian community, the Creator, Redeemer, and Holy Spirit together. And we participate in the divine life for which we were made when we receive Eucharist. And at Eucharist, we express our commitment to each other as well as to God. I know last week I mentioned that every Eucharist we do requires a whole team of people to carry it out. But even beyond that, in our words and actions during Eucharist, we express the commitment we have to each other as well as worshiping God. And in Eucharist, we celebrate and declare our belief in Jesus as Christ, just as Peter did in today's readings. So that's, that's the what and the how of how Eucharist works in our life. I talked about it more last week. So that's a short recap of where we stand in terms of our view of what's happening here on Sundays. We see what, what's next is the question then that is asked. What happens when a people filled with the Holy Spirit hit those doors? and go out. How, if we were a little fly on the wall, what would we see happening then? What would we observe? I'm going to tell you a whole slew of things that you already know. 
Because sometimes we live a life and we don't know we're living it. Sometimes we are a sign that we don't know we are. I know all of us in this room have probably had somebody come up and say to us, you did this or that, and it made such a difference to me in that moment. You said this or that, and it changed my whole view. It has resonated with me ever since. We've all, I'm sure all of us have experienced that. I know that as a preacher, it happens to me. Sometimes I'll see somebody in the store and they'll say, oh, that sermon, I've thought about it all week. And I'm like, that sermon was a dud. I, what did you hear? Because I'm pretty sure I didn't say anything that ought to resonate all week. We don't know what we're doing a lot of the time. We don't know who we're being. So let me tell you what somebody standing on the sidelines would see in this community of people who goes out having received the Holy Spirit in this liminal place and then hitting those doors. First of all, this place, this room, and echoed there at the parish hall, but this room, we maintain. We maintain a place, a geographic place, in the city of Squim that is wholly dedicated to God, to God's beauty, to God's glory, to the mystery and holiness of God here. This room is a result of the life we live as a Eucharistic community. Certainly our windows that express the life of the Pacific Northwest and are beautiful and captivating, draw us to meditation on the holy. And here in our ombre are the consecrated elements, which you can tell because of that candle, that red candle that's lit 24 seven to show us they are present. God is present in this specific spot. We do that out of the life we receive here. And it is a place to reflect and be still. Ken told me recently, you're aware I know of the stresses that his partner is undergoing and her illness. And he said, you know, I come to church and on Thursdays he vacuums in the church and dusts and cleans. And he said, and then I sit, I sit here with God. This room is that. We created that. We maintain that. We give that gift to others. We, you, you people maintain a sacramentalist who does sacrament with and for you. In this case, me. There is a person who, who is in charge of designing and giving and helping and nurturing your reception of the Holy Spirit here. You do that out of the power you receive at this altar. And spiritual formation goes on all around here, all around this property. Spiritual formation and care. We have lots of programs that help anyone who's interested grow in their spirituality. We care for each other in prayer. It's beautiful to watch. Someone recently said to me, oh my gosh, your prayer list. And you take that home? Somebody had traveled here and came through, she was leaving the next day. She said, you take this home and pray it? I'm like, yes, yes we do. And we let each other know how those prayers are going in our emails and by word of mouth. And over here we have our prayer order, the Daughters of the King who lead, not there, that's a Franciscan. Daughters of the King who lead our healing prayers during the 10 o'clock service. And over here we have another Franciscan. I, I didn't plan this, but hello. And 
candles so people can come forward. And you can do that all week long. Come forward by the candle for an intention that's on your heart. We pray for each other. Let's not leave out the religious vocations among us who live lives of service and prayer. In addition to our Daughters of the King prayer order, people who are vowed for that, that comes from the power we have, the Holy Spirit that we carry, the love that we carry out. And along with that prayer goes practical care of each other. Flowers that go out from our altar that heard our prayers, communion to homes, meals, rides, hand-holding, care for each other in all the times when we need care. This is a place where we can express our own personal gifts as well. The Bazaar Guild, who puts on our beautiful bazaar every year, that who makes everything we sell, the quilt that you see out front is just part of the quilters that come here and offer their gifts. We have musicians. We have leaders of, of studies. We have, we have all kinds of people who do all kinds of things for us. That's empowered by the Holy Spirit and the Eucharistic life that we live. This is a place where we can have fun together. Right, Chris? We have a plot. Something's coming. It's going to be fun. Well, you're mostly plotting. I'm just enjoying. <laughs> yes, it's a place where we have fun. And this is a sanctuary. We are allies for anybody who is less than, who is oppressed, who is marginalized in our society. They can come here and they'll find safety and kindness. And we extend welcome and care to others in the community. Soup's On is an obvious example. The Celtic concerts are an example. All of the music thing, events that we offer in terms of the concert in the park and our jams, just examples of the welcome and care we offer to other people in the community. We are able to do all of this because of what happens right here. This is not something we would be able to sustain. We are not just a group of like-minded people joined up together. In fact, you'd be hard-pressed to find two of us who are of the same mind on some things, right? They always say Episcopans fight like crazy and then all come to the altar together. This is what drives this life. It reminds me of what Elisha and Elijah said to each other when Elijah was about to go up into heaven in the chariot of fire. As they made that final journey before Elijah went up, he kept telling Elisha, stay here, stay behind, don't come. They didn't know what was going to happen. They didn't know if this would be one of those experiences where Elijah went up in the fiery chariot and everybody else around turned to ash. Elijah didn't know if Elisha would see something that traumatized and grieved him, and we hear that he did, in fact, feel trauma and grief in that event. He didn't know. He wanted Elisha to be saved. This man was like a son to him, and he wanted him to stay behind. And Elijah, Elisha said, as the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. We have that stance with each other through our Eucharistic life. As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. That's the life of the Trinity that we carry. This is what God says to us in the Eucharist. This is what we say to each other each time we come to this rail. 
Joshua called together the tribes and told them, choose this day whom you will serve. We choose a Eucharistic life where we live and say what Peter said, Lord, to whom can we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. This is the life to which we find ourselves called, the life to which we invite others. In his beautiful writing, beautifully read, thank you, Carol, beautiful writing about the armor of God that we just heard from Paul. I'm struck by something he says, as shoes for your feet, put on whatever will make you ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. The first step, I think, is this, come to the table. Amen.